Call me to order, Mr. Clerk. Turn my own mic on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first item is the minutes of the Engineering, Utilities, and Environment Standing Committee meeting of April 26. Recommendations to approve those minutes. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. First item, please. First item of business is the Coquitlam River Watershed Strategy Phase 3 update. Um, we have an introduction by Mr. Bill Suzak, General Manager of Engineering and Public Works, and a presentation by Margaret Birch, Environmental Services Coordinator. The staff recommendations that the committee receive this report for information. Mr. Suzak. I'll be very brief, uh, Mr. Chair. This, uh, this is a work in progress uh, that should be leading to a, uh, a, a more formal report with recommendations later uh, in July. Uh, Margaret Birch is here to do a, uh, a short uh, presentation on uh, what's happened over the past year, uh, uh, where we're at now, and uh, what is expected to occur over uh, the next couple of months and, uh, and then over the next uh, few months after that in a, in a future phase. So, Mar Margaret, if you could please and thanks. Welcome, Margaret. Is it on? Okay. Yep. Good afternoon. I'm Margaret Birch, and I'm the Environmental Services Coordinator with the Environmental Services Division, and and now with uh, Engineering and Public Works. For the past few years, I've also served as the co-lead for the Coquitlam River Watershed Strategy, and I. Uh, work with Glenn Joe, the fisheries resource worker with Coquitlam First Nation. I will be providing a brief update on the phase three portion of the Coquitlam River watershed strategy. I've also invited Julie Gardner, who's just behind me here, with Dovetail Consulting Group to attend today's standing committee. Julie has provided the facilitation and consulting role through phase three and provides the support to the project team. Julie is available to answer any questions you might have following the presentation. The Coquitlam River Watershed Strategy Project is nearing completion of its third year, or Phase 3 as we have called it. Phase 3 is part of a multi-phase project aimed at developing a governance framework that would collectively address the long-term sustainability for the Coquitlam River. The initiative began in late 2007 following support from the Coquitlam River Aggregate Committee with a recommendation to Council to undertake this watershed planning process. At that time, many watershed stakeholders, each with legitimate and competing interests in the watershed, were finding collaboration and effective problem solving a challenge. The aim of this phase three was to build on the work that has been done to date and develop a terms of reference for a new governance body for the Coquitlam River watershed. Full details of the phase three report will be, coming, will be forthcoming to council in July. This work that I will be discussing uh, was undertaken through planning and delivery of three public events starting last fall in October, February, and March. Okay. In developing a terms of reference for a governance body, there are several key elements required. First, in order to provide a context, we need a, uh, and a, and a um, purpose to drive the rationale for a new body, it must include a summary description of the watershed. A draft summary description was developed with the involvement of the Coquitlam River Aggregate Committee and discussed as part of two workshops during phase three uh, held this year. A working version was agreed upon at the March 18th workshop as included in your report. A terms of reference also requires a common vision and values and a mission statement to describe the ideal future of a new organization define why the organization exists and what it will do. During the previous phase two, a common vision and values of the watershed were confirmed. A mission statement was also developed in the previous phase. However, further discussion is still warranted before it reaches final form. Though it was discussed through phase three, it, um, it wasn't finalized and it will be resolved in a future phase. The key work though of phase three was to agree to a set of guiding principles and a structure for this new body. Okay. Guiding principles will guide how an organization will operate to, and to achieve its mission. These statements or themes focus on achieving success of this organization. They also respect an organization's stated values. During phase two, possible guiding principles were introduced based on those followed by other watersheds. However, from this early work and additional research, through workshop discussions, it led through phase three to these 
uh, main themes. More details behind these themes will be shared in the full summer report in July. These principles are, were supported by the, at the, by the February workshop participants. They were reviewed again in the March workshop with some additional comments that will be reflected in our final report. Also, as part of the elements of a terms of reference is a, as a structure. Uh, through the, the last workshop in March, the, um, the results uh, resulted in a Coquitlam River Watershed Roundtable. The basic structure is a roundtable with members represented of the various sectors with interest in the Coquitlam River Watershed. Governments of the watershed will be represented on the roundtable, but the roundtable will be independent of government, that is not under the direction of governments in the watershed. The roundtable would be accountable following the direction as set to a vision, its values, mission, and its guiding principles. The roundtable cannot make decisions that are related to jurisdictional authority and legislative responsibilities. The body can only collaborate and help in providing information to key stakeholders with authority to assist them in their decisions. Activities for this new body would be in, uh, involve several areas, coordination of various interests, coordination of information, education, stewardship, monitoring, and planning. A core committee would be used uh, to serve as an administrative body or an executive to support the round table and a funding group involving governments and other entities could provide a continuity to this round table. <clears throat> so just to wrap here, the further details of a draft governance strategy will be, are now being prepared and finalized with the project team and our facilitator. Uh, all the meeting notes would be included in a phase three report and would be brought forward uh, with a staff report with recommendations for council consideration in July. The project team also will be communicating its results of phase three to the Coquitlam First Nation and the city of Port Coquitlam this summer. Uh, provided, um, uh, um, provided we read the, the, the presentation in July, we, uh, the hope is to seek support by the key stakeholders to move forward to an implementation phase. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Councillor Robinson. Um, actually, it's not, it's not a question, but it's a kudos uh, to Margaret and to her team because um, I went to the March 18th, I think it was 18th, meeting, and um, I've done collaboration with folks and looked at doing uh, collaborative, um, collaborative development of, of governance structure, and I have never seen, um, I, I guess, so many stakeholders at one table and really, truly working in a collaborative format with such respect. Um, for the various stakeholders. Um, I was very impressed with um, how well it was moving forward, even though I'm sure it feels like moving a big boulder uphill at times, I'm quite impressed with how much progress you've made in a relatively short period of time. And I really do look forward to phase four and uh, seeing what could come out of it. Because when I envision about what it will be like for us as a council, for us as a community, is that it means that there's one body that we can go to and deal with when there are issues around this watershed and that I think will make life way easier for us as a city and I think um, for the community as a whole. So I, I, I'm glad to see that you're on track and I look forward to seeing uh, what else comes out of it. Thank you. Good. And once again, Margaret, a, a job well done. It's not complete and this has been a couple, about a year and a half now. Three and a half now, yeah. So it is not Since been a quick late process. Late 2007. Yeah, it's not been a quick process. <laughs> Thank you very much, Margaret. I'll move receipt. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next item, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next item is the proposed UBCM resolution for a reservoir flood buffer. Uh, again, we have an introduction by Mr. Bill Suzak um, and the staff recommendations that Council endorse the proposed UBCM resolution on reservoir flood buffers um, attached as Appendix A to the report that is before you and that staff be directed to forward a copy of this report to Port Coquitlam for their information and consideration. Moved. Second, Mr. Suzak. Uh, th thanks, Mr. Chair. This uh, report arises out of uh, recently dealing with uh, with this issue, where both the cities of Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam uh, are really the only payers, if you will, of of compensation uh, to BC Hydro as a result of uh, this particular flood uh, mitigation strategy. We feel that there are many uh, benefiters 
uh, to this kind of a strategy, uh, and uh, we've uh, we've thought that a um, that a UBCM resolution might be an appropriate uh, venue uh, for for how we are thinking uh, uh, about this issue. Uh, we think that there is capacity uh, within BC Hydro to uh, take a look th at this issue and uh, and at least assist uh, some municipalities who who are faced with being the sole payers. Thank you very much, Mr. Suzak, and I agree. I'm, I'm glad to see this before us and going forward. When we first had this issue brought to us about the flood buffer and the issue of us having to pay some compensation, both cities had brought in hydro and we we're not happy in that regard. So I agree with the staff's report and I hope this gets an endorsement at the UBCM. Thank you, Mr. Suzak. Any other questions? No? Nope. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next item, please. Next item, item four, uh, concerns a uh, report about mitigating the impact of development. Uh, we have an introduction by Mr. Bill Suzak and the staff recommendations that council endorsed the general direction and enforcement practices for regulation of construction zones as outlined in the report. Mr. Suzak, please uh, again. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, is an, this is an interim report, a, uh, a fuller report that, discuss, that discusses uh, the potential for, uh, uh, for needing more resources to uh, effectively enforce, uh, enforce all of these measures should be available by uh, about the end of June or certainly, certainly before the summer break. Uh, this is a report that discusses staff's analysis of the situations uh, that are occurring up in the Northeast and, and they are problematic uh, and we expect that uh, uh, the Northeast development in terms of construction impact issues will be um, a little more problematic uh, than Westwood Plateau where the city was dealing with essentially only one, one developer, uh, one builder. Uh, up in the Northeast we have many uh, developers and builders and, uh, uh, and, and hence uh, some issues. Uh, this report has some uh, photographic examples of what we feel are okay from our perspective uh, and what is not okay. Uh, and we remain open to uh, you know, any specific direction that committee and council provides to staff in terms of how to manage this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Suzak. I see other people have questions. I'm just going to go to Councillor Robinson first and Mayor Stewart. Thank you. I, I have a question actually about um, enforcement and um, when we do issue a ticket and there's $75 tickets, it looks like, and some 50 and that's not very significant, first of all. And second of all, if they have a second or third infraction, do these um, increase uh, substantially? Is there? There's a reason. So I'm just wanting to know, we need to, I think, have stronger deterrence. I can, I, I can take perhaps the first crack at that. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the fines, uh, I think, are extraordinarily low and they need to be looked at. Uh, that would be a, a topic of a future report. Uh, we have acted on the damage deposit issue. Uh, that is, we've agreed that, yeah, that's going from 600 to a $5,000 uh, deposit to take care of potential damages. We have not taken a detailed look at the fine levels, uh, but they do seem low, and uh, we think that we do have to act on that, too. Great. Thank you. I, I'm actually, I'm very pleased to see this come before us. We've had numerous complaints, and uh, it's, from my perspective, I'm so pleased to see how quickly staff have acted on that and um, have identified ways to, to manage this. But I would really like to see those fines, you know, increase. And then for, for subsequent fines for the same infractions, I think they need to uh, get exponential um, because, you know, we might want to start with a $200. We'll give you a little bit of a break. But if it keeps going, then we need to, I think, um, increase significantly. To, Okay, thank you. Mayor Stewart? Well, I certainly, I certainly have the same questions related to enforcement and the repeat offender. Not so much even the repeat offender, but the uh, offender that doesn't remove the offending material in a couple of days. I'd, I'd really want us to look at the fines, make sure that we can levy another fine uh, a day later, and, and quite frankly, make sure that we do do that. But the issue I want to take with uh, Really, the only negative I found in the report was the title, um, because this isn't the impact of development. This is the impact of really idiotic construction or poor construction practices, and and uh, and it would be the case if it were a single-family home <coughs> being developed in uh, being built in a uh, an existing neighborhood or wherever anywhere that this kind of uh, construction takes place. 
um, we should make sure that we're protecting our citizens, um, uh, not just in the northeast sector, but right across the region. So uh, this is the impact of uh, um, when, when people that are incompetent get involved in construction, and uh, we should be uh, clamping down really tight. Thank you. That's it? Okay, I just have some points. I've been dealing with engineering, raising this issue with staff, and they've been uh, bringing this forward due to some of these issues here. And it's there's a lot of good builders, and we have a lot of builders that aren't doing a very good job and need to be brought into compliance. And we need to raise our standards here in the city to get that compliance. And this is what w uh, this report and hopefully the future report's aim is, is raising the standards. Now, picture five shows something that's acceptable, which I don't agree with, is... Um, the temporary storage of construction material, a manhole barrel. These boulevards, um, there should be nothing on there. Our city property, we have planted trees in there. There's no reason for any material. And I think where we got into this problem initially is we tried to show some lenience, so okay, you store a little bit of stuff, but we wind up with, you see in picture six, the extent of that. So I think what I want to create and have staff be aware of a zero tolerance policy along our boulevards. And we also found out through this process that we're looking at putting in a, our bylaws, a snow fencing requirement. We don't have any requirements right now for fencing around the trees, which should be done to help protect those trees and that soil system around it, because this is also an infiltration area for the uh, development. Um, I'm pleased with this report and the direction it's going. Um, I agree with Council Robinson's statement uh, that the fines, and that, as Mr. Suzak said, they are reviewing the fines with the idea to bring them up to today's standards and for better compliance. <coughs> so if it's maybe a 75, might be a $200 fine, and once again, as Council Robinson mentioned, a, an increasing for future violations. Um, we've also got people living in a construction zone, and while people can accept living within a construction area and they understand that there are certain standards that should be set to minimize that impact on those people that are now moved in there. Um, well, Mr. Suzak, do you have any comments in regard to zero tolerance along the boulevard, sir? Uh, we, we certainly will follow uh, committee and council's direction in the matter. Uh, there, there certainly might be some, some pushback from, uh, from builders. Uh, however, we will um, uh, take action if council feels uh, that that is the way to go. Um, we would appreciate uh, a formal resolution in that matter. Uh, that, would, that would help us uh, significantly. So if we could uh, ask that, that you make that as a motion to council and then we'll take that as, we'll take that. That as direction and, and proceed accordingly. So it's been moved and seconded. Mayor Stewart. Yeah, I, and I understand the sentiments behind it. I'm not certain, though, that, um, and I, I take staff, I, I ask staff for a bit of direction here because I want to know whether, in fact, um, this is a, a, a serious problem. I, I don't know that that uh, particular example in, in number five is a problem that I need to fix. And so I, I don't know whether zero tolerance is what I'm looking for. I look through here of, of some enormous issues, um, and to me, um, we've got a long way to go. I'm not sure that, I don't know where the zero tolerance, I'm just, uh, I'm not sure that that's where I want to go. Well, just uh, from my point of view is that, once again, these boulevards are used for infiltration. You're putting anything like that, 200 pounds, compact in the soil there, and you're going to have, we've had the full two stack sump stacked on there. We've had piles of, of, of delivered lumber mm -hmm. stacked on there. And so the issue is, if you set a policy of zero tolerance, what it, all it takes for these people is to better manage their sites and put more effort into cleaning up their sites after they're finished at the end of the day. And I think we have a, quite a situation now that's got out of hand, and I think we need to set a standard, and they just have to put some more effort into planning how they do their site and manage their site and put some extra effort into it. I think a lot of this happens to be just sloppy lack of effort on some of these builders' parts. Because there's other builders up there. A lot of them are doing a fine job. Their sites are clean. They have nothing on the boulevard, and they're doing a great job. So I, I want this to be a level playing field with the good developers up there, and uh, builders, I should say. Mm -hmm. That's my point. Councillor Robinson. 
I concur. I, I think um, what would they do if there were no boulevards? If the boulevards weren't there, they would still have to find place for all of their stuff. And it would typically have to be in their site somewhere, or perhaps on the road, I don't, um, in a neat pile in some sort of format. And their folks won't be able to park right in front of the site. They'll have to park somewhere else and walk. So I, I think that um, I think we get to set a standard. And like uh, Councillor Asmundson pointed out, if other builders are doing it, there's no reason why it can't be done. So um, I, I think there is nothing like setting uh, a standard for um, striving for excellence and, um, and not settling. So I would like to uh, include that amendment to this, this list. Uh, Thank you, uh, Councilor Stewart. Oh, and, I, and, I, and I'll withdraw the objection. I, I, my, from my perspective, there are other issues. I mean, in the same photo, for example, the truck is parked too far from the curb, such that we, and we already know the problems we've got when construction vehicles are parked in on on, on roadways on both sides, and then we can't get uh, another construction vehicle or an emergency vehicle down the middle. So I mean, there's all kinds of issues that we have to, to deal with, and, and I, I just don't want our bylaw enforcement officers to be up and spending all their time up in, in those areas, but I, I, I'll i agree, you know, it's about site management, it's about making sure that the good builders aren't penalized, because that's what it, it's what it is. If, if we don't enforce good behavior, if we don't reward behavior, essentially what we're doing is punishing the good builders because they end up um, incurring some costs that other people don't have to incur. Um, I, I want us to make sure that our neighborhoods, uh, whether they're under construction or uh, already lived in, are as, as tidy as possible, and uh, so I'll, I'll go along with it. Thank you very much. Could I, I really believe that once we get the final report back and settle on all these issues that we're going to be doing, and our staff is up there enforcing some of the parking bylaws issues, and they're spending more time up there than what they probably should be, but. Once the standard set and the message gets out, they won't have to spend as much time up there, and that's like anything. So, all those in favor? Opposed? Mm -hmm. Carried. That's just the amendment. That's just the amendment. Now on the main item, uh, Councillor Robinson has another Thank question. Thank you. I, I do. So I noticed that in the next steps we're going to be um, speaking with the um, development com community, home builders, UDI, that's great, in an on-site meeting with the, the developers and um, builders who are currently up there. Is there any intention of just touching base with residents to let them know that you know, we're taking some action? Because I think we've received numerous complaints from the residents up there, and I think it would be great to be able to communicate with them that you know, we're stepping up um, enforcement, taking a look at some of this, and that they can expect uh, a tidier community um, over the coming weeks and months. Sure. Mr. Sure, sure, Mr. Chair, I think I think we could take that as uh, as as direction. Uh, the um, you know the area currently is reasonably uh, tight enough for us, for example, to potentially do uh, a directed mail drop, a one pager that um, uh, that says here's here's what we're looking at. I think that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. No other questions. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next item, please. Next item, item five. It concerns regional solid waste management plan and local solid waste issues. Uh, we have an introduction by Mr. Bill Suzak. Uh, the staff recommendation is a series of eight recommendations, which I uh, won't read out for the committee's benefit, but is before you uh, on the agenda. Thank you. Mr. Suzak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, as a region, we are approaching uh, a very important uh, decision point uh, in uh, deciding how to move forward with our uh, uh, draft solid waste management plan for the region. It has uh, likely significant uh, cost implications. Uh, this report uh, analyzes uh, the process to date uh, and comes up with, uh, with staff's view of, of the process and, and perhaps where we should be, uh, where we should be going. Uh, the report also discusses more local issues like the, uh, uh, the transfer station and, and upping our organics collection. Uh, however, uh, the main thrust of this report is to uh, test committee uh, and, and Council's um, uh, position uh, on where we are at as a region. This report um, recommends uh, that the region uh, take a pause uh, and do one of two things prior to committing to a specific uh, technological option. Uh, one, uh, go to market uh, and test 
uh, all feasible uh, options that are out there for uh, solid waste disposal. If not that, uh, then have an independent uh, risk assessment audit done of the assumptions behind uh, of the current solid waste management plan. Some of those assumptions have been looked at, but they've been looked at by organizations with rational self-interest. <coughs> For example, uh, uh, landfill operators who might be against the direction of <coughs> waste to energy. Uh, so some independent uh, analysis and advice on, on those assumptions might be the best thing. Uh, and, th and that concludes my uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Suzak, and I gather Councillor Robinson has a couple questions. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this report. It's, um, it's been a very interesting time um, when waste to energy, uh, but really when folks are really talking about incineration, it's sort of the gaming and gambling sort of dichotomy that when it's okay, it's gaming, and when it's a problem, it's gambling, and when it's okay, it's waste to energy, and when it's not okay, it's incineration. But really, we're all talking about the same thing. Um, I'm curious about... Um, how re this idea of 70% reduction, and have they, do you know, if they've looked at, well, well what if we go to 75%, will that change? Is that, is that the example of the assumptions that you're, you're looking at? Like, well, does that change what other options there are in terms of modeling? Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Minimum, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, I think that's exactly the kind of, of, uh, of, um, of independent um, advice uh, we would all benefit from. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask Mr. Zaborniak if he, if he has any knowledge about whether there have been uh, sensitivity analyses done on uh, the level of, um, of diversion and uh, what that might do to assumptions of going to a particular uh, disposal technology. Uh, just before we get, get there, um, uh, this report also does deal with local diversion, and uh, we have we have come uh, up quite a bit in a test case for organics diversion. Uh, so 70 percent um, looks feasible; it will be uh, a stretch. Uh, but the point of whether or not we could go even further is, um, is still out there. Mark, any comments? Sure. Uh, yeah, through the chair, um, so they at various um, meetings, I guess, with the public, they did consider. Or, talk about whether the public felt that they could get beyond 70 percent. Um, ultimately, I think if once you get to 70 percent, you're pretty much leading the world. So I think that question was uh, asked of, and Bridget can, can uh, probably provide more detail, but was asked of uh, Metro Vancouver staff by the board, could, can you get beyond 70 percent? And the, the answer that they had was that 70 percent is pretty aggressive. Um, it's, it, it, is. it means a lot of people have to participate at a very high level, so I think uh, you want to be somewhat conservative. You don't want to assume that you can go beyond that because that would that would be world leading to be at that point. And if I could just put my spin on this, uh, I think there's significant level of comfort uh, among our staff that the 70% target is a good target, has been tested, and is uh, a stretch goal. And, uh, and we are totally supportive of that as the target. Where we are not yet at that comfort level is the ultimate disposal uh, issue, whether or not it should be landfill or uh, waste energy or those kind of things. And that is the area we think would really benefit from some really independent uh, probing in, in terms of um, the assumptions, um, some of the numbers that are out there in terms of this would cost, uh, you know, so much less than that. It just sort of stretches uh, credibility in our, in our view, and we believe that, the, that that's the area that really needs uh, some further in-depth looks. I, 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 I would agree. I'm, I'm not, that's, uh, that's not quite the question I'm asking. I, I, I think that 70% is the stretch, but if it were 75%, then perhaps certain technologies would no longer make sense. Yes. So... That's part of what I'm, I'm wondering. So, um, for example, if, if uh, it was agreed that incineration would be a, a, a terrible thing for us to have if we, we had 75% diversion because there wouldn't be enough waste, then that factors in a whole bunch of other things because we have this zero waste challenge on the one hand, but we're, we're, we're not really saying we're going to go to zero waste. We're going to have 30% waste. So. I'm just looking to see if there's at some uh, what's the tipping point for where waste energy might not make any sense. 
So I, I'm just I'm curious about, and those are just some of the assumptions that I'm wondering that, that are in there. So the, the, only, the last question I have, if I might, just has Please. to, I only have one more question. I'll have others later. Um, the timing on making a decision around automated, our own, our own waste. Um, and I love seeing that um, the organics has been really great. It's gotten us to 61%, uh, or can get us to 61%, which I think is fabulous. Um, and if we're going to commission a study on the pros and cons of an automated system, what's the timing on that? Because uh, we have... Is it a year and a half left on our contract with, the with, with, with Smith Wright? So I'm just looking at a sense of timing. So, you know, when we go to tender, what does that look? What's the, just what's the timing look like on that? Mr. Suzak, please. Sure. Oh, I, I would imagine that the uh, that the study would uh, would likely be complete uh, sometime in the uh, first quarter uh, of next year. It would probably take us uh, the next couple of months to come to grips with terms of reference commissioning a, and, and, and commissioning um, a consultant. Uh, the work should be uh, available well in advance of, um, uh, of, of, of the cycle for the next contract. Okay. And will we be considering then in-house as part of the overall look the, or the, not? The, uh, the, uh, the study that we will commission uh, will investigate uh, uh, the pros and cons of automated service in Coquitlam, independent of who, who, who might be the service provider. Uh, it will also inform us what the, uh, what the costs may be uh, should the city decide to, to, to take that service in-house. I, I only ask the question because apparently it's a year before you can get a truck if you're going to go in-house, uh, so you I'm, need a 12-month uh, sure. So I'm just looking at timing if that sure. is just, um, something uh, we're, we're considering. Mark, is it, is it, I'm sure I have this correct, it's 2012 that the contract is, is yes, it the renewal? Yes, okay. 20, so that, so we, June 2012. We, should, we, we should be there in plenty Great. of time. Great, I just want to check on that. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Well, a very good report, Mr. Suzak. I'm quite, uh, I think there is unanswered questions on the uh, regional solid waste plan. Uh, a lot of people, I think, are Needing, but the other thing, I, I guess, what I talk about is the actual financial cost. We're still not quite sure about that. And we need to explain the cost to, to achieve 70% diversion rate and the cost of waste to energy with tipping fees and all that to our ratepayers. What's this going to look and what impact is this going to have? Because the cost associated with just what we've done with the, the improvement of our water, uh, our last bill, $31, was directly of our water bill related to the Seymour Capital and all the increases. Illustration. Yeah. So we have to, part of this I want to be able to have Metro give us the impact of what's this going to be coming down and how we can break it down to what our ratepayers are going to be seeing. And I understand to me, to get to seventy percent, people always think, well that's great, we're diverting, we're doing good. But there's an increased cost associated to achieve that. And they, what's the increased cost in the waste to energy. Uh, so that's one thing I think I still need to see. Um, the, I'm glad with number three here because I raised the issue about um, Cash Creek has a year and a half left, but the minister's allowed, I think, another 17 years, but Metro needs to negotiate something on a landfill regardless of how they make their decision, Mr. Suzak. So that's a very good recommendation. Um, the other point is on the waste energy, and I, I guess this is quite key, it's on um, page three. The amount and firm value of energy that can be recaptured through the process is not fully understood and is highly dependent on the siting of the waste energy plant location. Heat to energy can be transferred. So, I mean, we're really, they're really speculating, and I'm glad that you really pointed out, Mr. Suzak. Sure, uh, sure, Mr. Chair. One, one of the um, uh, uh, points, I guess, we, we want to emphasize is that the current plan uh, does not deal with a site-specific comparator, uh, and, and that that issue that you just raised uh, is an element of what uh, we call approval risk. Hmm? And there are all kinds of approval risks involved in the direction of the current plan. Uh, there is an approval risk with respect to siting. For example, presumably a zoning will be required within the region in order to create such a plan. A further approval risk is that BC Hydro will actually allow an intertie at 
a price that is, is favorable to, to the business case. Uh, and uh, we are going down a road where we are writing a plan that emphasizes a particular technology or a process without necessarily covering off enough of those approval risks. And we feel that this, um, I guess, sober second look would help assess that level of risk. Uh, Councillor Reed. Okay, being a novice to this austere committee, I my question has to do with when and you were you were there on the Saturday and we listened to all the things um, Metro had to say to us, but when it came down to the waste to energy component, the last component, um, someone brought up the fact that it just doesn't it just doesn't mean um, burning incineration. And if, is that true, for one thing, Mr. Suzak? And are there parts of the waste to energy component that you do like, that you feel have perhaps, like are there other than incineration, are there other parts of waste to energy that we would find acceptable? Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the only other um uh, feasible process that I'm aware of is pyrolysis or gasification or the process that was brought forward by the Plasco company in Port Moody about 18 or so months ago. That's the only one? I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of really other kinds of waste to energy. There are other kinds of processes involve, involving uh, mechanical biological treatment, but those are not necessarily waste to energy processes. Um, sorry, I, I, there, there was a, I, I, might, I might have lost the specific question. That, <laughs> no, that no, was that's sort it, of it. No, you got it. I think that's it. When, when, I, when we were there and someone questioned um, why they were just saying incineration, somebody stood up and said, well, waste to energy really encompasses many different right, uh, just things. One, one thing for clarification and for context, um, uh, all of the um, uh, analysis and, and comparators uh, used by the Metro Vancouver study uh, deal with mass burn facilities. It is true that waste to energy can mean something other than mass burn incineration. Uh, however, their financial analysis and uh, a lot of their air quality analysis, et cetera, et cetera, is predicated on a oh, mass wait. burn facility. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's it? Yeah. That's... Mayor Stewart? Well, in fact, there were, um, uh, at the Metro Vancouver board uh, level, there was a proposed amendment from Vancouver that suggested that we contemplate uh, processing methodologies that, uh, other than mass burn, uh, that, that there, I mean, we recognize that there are some others, but uh, that this report does, so far, only seem to focus its attention on mass burn as though that's the, the only solution other than storage in a, in a landfill. Just a, Mr. Just, just a quick comment, just, just top of mind, uh, it, it, landfilling, if it, if it is done very ef, uh, efficiently, can be a form uh, of, of waste to energy. For example, the, um, uh, the waste tech company that currently operates the Cache Creek facility uh, is, uh, is planning for uh, the capture of the landfill gas and putting that gas uh, into the engines uh, of the trucks that they, that they utilize, which would you know, tend, to, uh, tend to have a zero uh, net effect, if you will, on, on the greenhouse gases. Uh, so they are, they are looking at ways at trying to improve their performance, um, which is laudable. Uh, the, the direction that we're heading, heading toward, though, as a, as a region is to uh, have a different emphasis and not necessarily uh, even consider some of, some of those issues. Thank you, Mr. Suzak. And um, my, my initial comments, though, were uh, and it, and it related to the meeting that we were at, uh, the, the Council of Council meetings, which was a, me is a meeting of all the, the council, mem council members from across the region are invited to it. And in the end, everyone agrees, I think, that zero waste isn't what we mean because there's going to be some left. Everyone agrees that we should have extended producer re responsibility, EPR, that reduces the amount of garbage and 
puts back on the producer of the packaging the onus to um, recycle it or develop processes that will allow it to go back into the, to be reused or to be recycled. And having done all of those things, I think we all agree that we should, as a community, adopt these other provisions, get organics out, get plastics out, get glass out, and make sure that we are as efficient as possible in the recycling, which will leave us about 30% of the total amount of waste uh, produced. And then as a growing population, we will have to manage that reality as well. So I, I'm not certain that the debate is proper, being properly framed, and I'm glad that this report's before us, because I think it's, it starts to frame the debate in a different way. The debate at the, the Saturday's Council of Council meetings was not, what do you want to do with your garbage? It was, what do you think of this solution? And then, of course, everyone comes out and this is, this is wrong or this is wrong. In the end, we have to do something with about 30% of the garbage we produce because, or maybe it's 28% or maybe it's 25% if we get really, really good at it. Um, right now, we burn some of it and we store some of it, uh, we put some of it in, in a very sensitive land uh, down at Burns Bog and we truck some of it up to Cash Creek and British Columbia also s sends some of its garbage down to the United States. So the question before us ought to be, what do you want to do with your garbage? Because we got to do something with what's left. We can do everything possible and reasonable to get, to reduce it, to make sure that it's as the minimum possible and that we've recycle the rest of it as much as we can, and then we're going to be left with some. And your report adequately and appropriately suggests the question ought to be, what do you want to do with it? Because you've got to do something. Thank you. That's it. Well, Mr. Suzak and to your staff, I want to thank you. This is a, a complex issue. It's been going on for a number of years at Metro. We do not have the staff that can be put to this task, and I think for staff to take extra time, review this, a lot of this body work, come up with this recommendations, which is a very good report. I'm very pleased about it. I just want to thank you very much for this report and the time that you took to deal with this issue, because it's a very important issue in the region that we're dealing with. So I want to thank you and your staff for the good work that you've done on this report. The, the, it's been moved and seconded? It has not. Okay. okay. I'll second it. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next item, please. Next item, item six, uh, is report of both the General Manager of Strategic Initiatives and the General Manager of Engineering and Public Works. It concerns the Portman Highway 1 status report. Uh, we have introduction by Mr. Maurice Gravel with additional comments by Mr. Bill Suzak. The staff recommendations that the committee receive this report for information. Well, I think we'll just go straight to Mr. Gravel and let Mr. Gravel give this. His Thank you. Um, uh, to the Chair, I'd just like to highlight some of the key points from our informational report uh, with respect to the Portman Highway 1 project. Uh, with respect to construction, work by Kiewit on the entire project is proceeding at a very rapid pace on the Portman Bridge, Cape Horn Interchange and all work in between, uh, as well as the King Edward Overpass. And uh, with respect to the King, Over King Edward Overpass, um, Kiewit is currently working on all the utility relocations that need to happen before such time as it can actually start the bridge construction, which we anticipate starting to happen within the next few weeks. Uh, with respect to traffic detours, the current detour, which is the closure of King Edward from Lawheek to Woolridge, was put in place uh, in early February and will last uh, to the spring of 2011. Uh, to date, this de detour has worked reasonably well with limited complaints, and, and we're, but we're monitoring it on a regular basis, and some people have, phoning and, uh, have been phoning us and giving us some, um, uh, some ideas about uh, signage and that, and we're, we're looking at each and all, all of those ideas, and we're uh, making some minor changes uh, where we believe they should be warranted. So, that's been moving along quite nicely in terms of that detour. As well as a detour at the Mary Hill Bypass onto the eastern portion of United Boulevard is working quite well and we've only received limited complaints on that. So we're pretty pleased with the work uh, that's uh, gone to date and, and uh, the motoring public has been reasonably happy. With respect to communications, we're uh, updating our city website on a regular basis and uh, we've uh, undertaken a Shop United Boulevard insert in the Sun and Province and that's being sponsored by a number of businesses on United Boulevard as well as the city equipment. And we have teasers ads so that when you go into the website, uh, you can actually see the, uh, the detours that are happening and, and help educate people and, and, make, and let, help let them know that uh, United Boulevard is still open for business and traffic and can get down there uh, to shop down in those locations. 
Of special note is uh, there will be an open house um, on at City Hall, right here at City Hall on Tuesday, May 18th, and that will occur from 5 to 8 p.m. And this is being hosted by the province of British Columbia. And the purpose is to present information related to the Portman project and primarily the Cape Horn interchange. Uh, the scope of work covers basically from uh, the bridge, Portman Bridge, uh, heading uh, west uh, to the approximately the Brunette interchange. Uh, we'll have a large uh, model uh, on display uh, so that residents can actually come into our foyer and look at the model and hopefully be able to understand this very complicated interchange that uh, is in the process of being construction constructed as we speak. And to answer any questions from the public from the province's perspective in terms of the work that is happening on the Portman project. City staff will also be available at the open house and we'll have our King Edward uh, uh, pictures and, and that and we'll have staff to answer if anybody has any questions regarding the fit and finish uh, that was recently approved by uh, council here a, a few weeks ago in terms of enhancing the bridge for pedestrian and cyclists and, and really have a, a, a very nice looking uh, King Edward overpass at the end of the project. And finally, with respect to stimulus projects, this area is very, very, very um, uh, overwhelmed with construction in terms of the other projects that are happening. We have a stimulus projects that are happening on King Edward uh, and um, as well on um, Lawheek Highway uh, with respect to sewer improvements and pavement improvements and also on Schoolhouse. So there's a tremendous amount of work having to be done. This all relates to the stimulus package of the federal government and having these projects completed by the March 31st, 2000 and deadline. So we're under the gun to get all this work completed in a timely manner, as well as coordinate with the Portman Bridge improvements. But city staff are working closely to uh, make sure that all these detours and the related work are, are done in a coordinated fashion and we'll do our best to make sure that the, um, that the, that the delays to the public are kept to the minimum. Uh, that, um, that ends my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Gravel. Very good report. Any questions? Just, just an observation. Um, that uh, I used to work down at United and King Edward and I was happened to head down there not too long ago and the new detour is fabulous. Should have done it years ago because you can move around way better than you ever could. So, so I think in some ways I'm wondering if, you know, that the, these detours now actually have really actually helped some of the traffic flow. So hmm. the fact that you're not getting too many complaints I think is a really good sign of a well thought out plan. So my hat's off to you guys putting it all together. Thank you, and I've been very impressed. I drive through the road quite often. And I've been quite pleased at how smoothly things have transpired down there. It's an awful lot of construction work, um, a bit, quite a bit of disruption for those people in that area. But within a year and a half's time to two years, it's going to be quite an improvement in that area down there. So, Mr. Gravel, a very good report, and thank you very much. Seeing no other speakers, all those in favor? Do we move it? No one has not been moved yet. All those in favor? Opposed, carried. Next item, please. Next item, item seven, concerns a local area service. This one on Surf Crescent. The staff recommendations that council authorize staff to proceed with the installation of curb and gutter on Surf Crescent as highlighted in figure one of the report, subject to future certification of sufficiency by the city clerk. So moved. Second, and I just want to say that once again uh, to staff and to the residents of Surf Crescent for the speed in which the, the letters were sent out and returned and brought this back for us. So I'm quite happy to see this here. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. That is the end of the formal items on the agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, move adjournment. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much.